This is a Mark 8 hot end, but you probably already knew that just by looking at it because they are absolutely ubiquitous in the 3D printing industry in the budget category of FDM printers. What you're looking at is anything but a standard Mark 8 hot end. And that's the beauty of it is at this point, these things are very modular. And you might start asking yourself, why bother with something like a Micro Swiss when you can make a Mark 8 hot end, a high temperature, reliable, all metal system for the cheap. So how do we get to this point where this thing can handle ABS? Heck, could probably realistically do temperatures in excess of 300 degrees without much problem. Well, we got to change a number of things out. Whether it's just for reliability's sake or for the sake of being able to print high temperatures uh, in a safe manner. Because a standard Mark 8 hot end has the Bowden tube going down all the way to the nozzle. And PTFE, the stuff that Bowden tubes are made of, well, when you get past a certain temperature, they start to off-gas some toxic chemicals. That's why you need an all-metal hot end to print at high temperatures. To answer how we started out with a $3 hot end, and yes, you can actually get an entire Mark 8 system for $3, on places like AliExpress anyway, to something like this, which will cost you around $20, we gotta disassemble it and talk about each component individually. We're gonna build this hot end piece by piece, so that way you understand exactly why I've chosen the components that I have, and why they work in the manner that they do. So first, let's talk about the components themselves. So we're going to start the build by making it more reliable than a standard Mark 8 hot end, and that comes down to this. Now, your standard Mark 8 hot end will have threads, and those threads are what's used to hold a pneumatic coupler in place. The type of pneumatic coupler that comes with a Mark 8 hot end are typically very cheap. They use a tiny bit of pressure to keep everything snug, but those fail relatively quickly. So the next thing people try and do to make it more reliable is get a pneumatic coupler that has teeth that will grip onto a Bowden tube, but that also fails relatively quickly. This is what's known as a compression fitting. And although they're not very popular in the 3D printing industry right now, I've come to find that in my own testing with my custom Micro Swiss hot ends, that these are the way to go. They are extremely reliable. I have yet to actually encounter a failure with one after hundreds, if not thousands of printing hours. So this, is what we'll use instead of a pneumatic coupler. The installation at this point is the exact same as a pneumatic coupler. We take the fitting and just screw it into place. A fun fact, the threads on a standard Mark 8 are 1 8 inch British spec piping threads. Now we need to talk about how we're going to make this hot end capable of printing at high temperatures safely. And to do that, we're going to need to install a titanium heat break. Now a heat break's job is very simple. It's to prevent the transfer of heat from the heat block to the heat sink. You see, you'll want the heat block hot so that it melts the filament right in here as it goes into the nozzle. If heat transfers upward into the heat sink, you might accidentally start melting filament before you're supposed to, and that can cause a clog. Now we use titanium for this application for a very specific reason. Titanium is a very strong metal, although it is rather brittle, so you don't want to crash your hot end into the bed. You might actually snap the neck right here of the heat break, but it's a very poor conductor of heat relative to other metals that we could use in this application, which is perfect because, like we said before, we don't want heat transferring upward, so titanium will help keep the overall system strong, rigid, and reduce the heat 
that soaks in to the heat sink from the heat block. Now a standard heat break inside of a Mark 8 hot end is actually not much of a heat break at all. It's more of a retention mechanism to hold a Bowden tube in place. Because in a standard Mark 8 hot end, the Bowden tube goes all the way through the heat sink, partly through the heat block, and directly butts up against the nozzle. We're going to make this system completely full metal. So that way, the Bowden tube stops right up here and doesn't go anywhere near the heater block. To install a heat break like this into a Mark 8 hot end is pretty simple. We're going to take a look on the underside and you'll see that this heat break, which is designed for a Mark 8 hot end, will slide nicely into place. And we're going to focus the camera. There we go. We'll slide in nicely. It should be about the same size bore. And what we're going to do is we're going to get it so that its face is flush with the other face of the heat sink like that. And that'll be right about where we want it. And we're going to take the grub screw and gently tighten it down onto the heat break. We're not going to make our final tightening just yet, but this will help keep everything in place as we continue to assemble the hot end. The next component on our list is the heat block. Now this one is made specifically from copper and there's a reason I've chosen this. Now a standard Mark 8 hot end will come with an aluminum heat block but I think everyone should stop using aluminum heat blocks no matter what hot end you're using because quite frankly aluminum is a soft malleable metal and it only becomes more malleable the hotter it gets. And the reality is, not only does copper retain its temperature more stably than aluminum, but it's stronger. The chances of you destroying the threads on a copper block are significantly lower than on an aluminum block. When you tighten down the nozzle onto this block, you need to do it while the hot end is hot to account for thermal expansion. If you do that on an aluminum heat block you're restricted to, to about three newton meters of torque on the nozzle before you start to destroy the threads and if you destroy the threads on a heat block you will create a gap in between the heat break and the nozzle where plastic will ooze up build up and clog copper heat blocks are superior they are more reliable they are more robust and they allow for high temperatures and accurate PID tuning of the system. That's why we use it. So let's talk about how to properly install a heat block onto a heat break like this. Now this is the bottom of the heat block. So we're going to install it with the side that is completely flat and flush onto the heat break. Now we're going to just screw this together and we are aiming to get the heat break just low enough that it's about flush and in fact we're going to back it off a little bit because in order to do this properly we actually have to take the nozzle into account Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the nozzle onto the heat block and we are going to bottom out the nozzle all the way. This nozzle will not go in anymore. Once you've bottomed it out, back it off about a quarter turn and then continue to screw down the heat brake. Once you have the heat brake buttered up against the nozzle, you can then take the nozzle and tighten it down because it's going to be tightening down directly against the heat brake. We'll be doing a final tightening when everything is hot, but we're not quite done yet. You'll notice as we screwed everything in, there's a tiny bit of distance in between this nozzle 
in the face of the heat block, and that's okay because the nozzle is buttered up directly against the flat face of the heat brake. You'll also notice that our heat sink is not facing the proper direction. That's okay. At this point, we need to loosen up that grub screw as we're going to be making some tiny adjustments. Once we've loosened up the grub screw, we can freely rotate everything around. We only wanted that grub screw slightly tight so that we can hold everything together as we assemble it. These are where the screws come in. These screws are there to add rigidity to the system. They get screwed in through these holes on the heat block and they go into these threaded portions of the heat sink. So once we get this lined up, we'll start them by hand and there will actually be a point where these threads will bottom out and will not go any further into the heat sink. So we're going to do that. Almost there. And that's one of them. There will be two. So you can see we got the one side. And we are now going to do the exact same thing to the other side. I'm going to try and focus the camera here. There we go. Now, what you'll see is that the screws bottom out on one of the bottom fins of this heat sink. And you'll also notice that the heat block moves up and down. That's because the grub screw on the front that holds the heat brake is loose. So at this point, we want to pull the heat sink and the heat block away from each other. Once you have those two components pulled away from each other, at this point, we can do a final tight down of that grub screw. And now, the system is in place and it's very rigid. There will be no flexing in this system. And that's important because as we were saying before, titanium is a strong metal, but it is a brittle metal. If we ever encounter a problem where this hot end were to crash into the bed or were to get caught on something and get stuck, we would rather that force be transferred to these screws rather than the heat brake because the heat brake being titanium is brittle and is more likely to snap off than these metal screws which are made of stainless steel. So we're just about done installing the individual components that make up this hot end. The last thing we're going to talk about is the nozzle. This is an M2 hardened steel nozzle, and the reason we're using this instead of brass is, one, this is going to handle high temperatures a lot better than brass, because brass, much like aluminum, is soft and malleable. But on top of that, if we're going to be printing with high temperature filaments, that opens up the door to use things like carbon fiber or glow-in-the-dark, which those types of filaments are highly abrasive and even just doing a short print could widen the diameter of the inner bore of the nozzle if it's made of brass and completely mess up your print because that 0.4 millimeters that we have installed here can slowly become 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 and so forth as the abrasive filament wears away the inner part of the nozzle. So. M2 hardened steel nozzles are easy enough to find, and they're plenty cheap nowadays. It's really just a matter of tightening it down by hand. Once this is installed on the printer and you get it up to temperature, we're going to do a final tightening to ensure 
that we account for thermal expansion and make sure that this nozzle isn't going anywhere. Remember, it's metal butted up directly against metal on the heat break. So any gap in between those two surfaces of the nozzle and the heat break will allow plastic to ooze in between it and cause a clog. So remember, thermal expansion is your friend and also your enemy, but it's easy enough to account for. You just tighten everything down when it's hot. And that's how we go from a cheap Mark 8 hot end that was only capable of printing PLA to an all-metal Mark 8 hot end that's capable of high temperature printing with abrasive filaments while being reliable as a Bowden system.